Hello and welcome to a video from filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. I'm Chris the K and today I'll be talking about this. I'm very excited about this. What is this? It is a $10 Linux server slash camera with Wi-Fi and whatnot. Let's talk about it some more. The Sonato D1. I ordered this off Amazon for $9.99 the other day. Came in in two days, free shipping. So let, let's back up a little bit. A little while ago I did a live stream and in it I was talking about the price of stuff and how I hate the saying, you get what you pay for. Because I find that really expensive stuff and really cheap stuff aren't very good, but there's that middle ground that I think is better. One of those things is with electronics. If you buy something super expensive or super cheap, they tend to be locked down. Well, that's not really true with these cameras. These are actually pretty cheap. So actually cheaper is better in this case because if you buy some fancy camera from Google or some other big company, it's going to be locked down. There's not going to be much you can do with it that they don't want you doing. But a lot of these cheap Chinese cameras, as I've shown in the past, you can get a Linux root shell on them either through software or sometimes through a serial connection on the board. Well, one of my viewers was watching that and brought up a project called Thinjingo, I think is how you say it. And it's run by a guy named Josh, who seems super nice. I've been talking with him online just a little bit and watching some of his videos. And the point of the project is to take cheap cameras like this that come from China, that probably have spyware and whatnot on them, and install a privacy-friendly version of Linux that gives you a whole bunch of features. And again, super cheap cameras. I bought this one for $9.99, and I ordered two other ones uh, off AliExpress for $8 and change each. One is supposed to be an outdoor one, this is an indoor one, and another one that's supposed to be able to screw into a light bulb socket. This one is nice because there's no tools required. All you need is an SD card to load up fresh software on there. So I haven't done this yet. I'm excited about it. I've watched uh, Josh's video on doing it, but I'm gonna do it now and go over the same things, but also link to his videos and all the other links in the description of this video. But let's go ahead and start opening this up and have a look. Here we are on my non-messy desk and I'll just start taking stuff out. Uh, this is some sort of mounting bracket, I'm guessing. And again, it's a pan tilt, supposedly zoom, but no zoom uh, camera. Again, super cheap, but it's a Linux server. So even though I plan on using this as a camera, it's a $10 Linux server. It has motors in it, if you pull the motors off, you can use those as GPIO pins as well. Anytime I can get my hands on something under $10 that's running Linux that I can get a root shell on is just amazing to me. Continuing to take stuff out of the box, it comes with a nice long USB cable. According to Josh's video, this is for power only, so you're not going to be able to do data over this. Once you've installed the firmware, I guess there's a way where you can control it right through USB as well, but you won't be able to use this cable. Uh, some drywall nuts, a power brick, and... I think there's an owner's manual in here that I really don't care about. This is, again, the Sonato D1. And although you get this, you might think it's the same. Sometimes the hardware is different. There's actually two different models. You have to look at the board inside. I was thinking I'd just grab the image for one, try it. If it doesn't work, grab the image for the other. But I figure I should show you, just like Josh showed in his video, how to check your device, since this is somewhat of a tutorial, but also a learning process for me. All you have to do, I guess, is grab around the lip here and pull a little bit. There we go. There we go, and pops off. Move that forward, and there's a board in here. Okay, I have to get the light just right, but you'll see right there that there's a chip that says T23 on mine. So when you look at yours, it's going to either say T23 or T31. And when you go to the website to download the firmware, you have to make sure you pick the right one for your little processor on here. Okay, now I'll just snap the top back on, like so. There we go. Now on the camera, you just lift the lens up here and this is where the SD card goes, uh, normally for storage for the videos and photos that it might take, uh, but that's where we're gonna put our SD card with the firmware. So you need a micro SD card and you need to format it to a FAT32. That's very important, FAT32. And uh, whatever size you have is gonna work. The firmware is gonna be only a couple of megabytes. I have a 64 uh, gigabyte card here just because that's what I have. And this is just to load the firmware onto the camera. So once you load it up, you can take this out and you don't have to dedicate this card to that just for the firmware, but you could use it Again, if you're using this as a Linux server, or even if you're recording stuff from a camera, you might want an SD card in there. I'm not sure what the max uh, gigs it accepts is, but uh, let's go ahead and find the firmware for this camera on the website. So again, the project, I believe, is pronounced Thinjingo, and the website is thinjingo.com. When you get here, you'll be presented with a list of supported cameras. We can scroll down here till we find what we're looking for. We're looking for the Sonato D1, and again, there's two versions of the firmware. We have one for the T23 and one for the T31. Since I have the T23, since we looked inside, I'll go ahead and click on that, and I will download firmware file 
and I'll click save. And for this camera, it was an eight megabyte file, so it was downloaded pretty much instantly. Now we need to rename it as uh, v4 underscore all dot bin, and we're gonna put that onto the SD card. Okay, I have formatted and mounted my SD card. I'm in a directory where I downloaded the firmware. I've already renamed it to v4 underscore, uh, underscore all dot bin, and now I'm just gonna copy that uh, to my SD card. It only took a moment, and now I can unmount that and put it into the camera. Okay, so I have my SD card, I got the camera, I'm gonna insert the SD card into the camera. Now I'm going to plug the camera in, and it should start loading up that new firmware. We have a light here, which will eventually start blinking and then turn off, and uh, shouldn't take very long. Again, it's a very small piece of firmware. Uh, the camera will start doing things up on boot, moving around, pointing around like that. Let me talk again a little bit about this. So I just think any Linux device, I've done videos years ago, I used to have a little uh, wall plug that was able to control through Wi-Fi that I was able to access a shell on. This is even better because yes, I was able to on previous devices, previous cameras, wall plugs, get a shell and at that point I could modify that operating system, but you know a lot of these cheap devices are set to spy on us. We, it's just common knowledge, right? And although I could disable stuff and remove stuff, you never really know what's there. Maybe there's something deep down in the kernel. Well, this project, you know, eliminates all that because it replaces everything on the camera and adds a bunch of new features. But again, if you don't need a camera, it's still a very small, low-power Linux device for under $10. Again, this one was $9.99, shipped to me from Amazon in two days. I've ordered some other ones. One of them's an outside one, uh, so it's in a weatherproof enclosure. And again, they're not the best cameras in the world, and uh, supposedly a lot, with a lot of these devices, they'll say that they're a certain resolution, they're not. To me, none of that matters. As long as I can get a picture, that's, that's great. If I can connect to it through a network, that's great. But it is a small Linux device with Wi-Fi. Some of them have microphones and speakers in them, so you can communicate through them they have the camera again there's a, a motor in there to control the camera and move it around which you can disconnect and then use those as GPIO pins this is to me so much better than something like a Raspberry Pi which I have a video come out that I've already recorded but the video hasn't come out yet about why I don't really like the Raspberry Pi I find that there's a very small um, percentage of things that people do with Raspberry Pis that it makes sense to use a Raspberry Pi. They think I think they're overpriced for what they are. I think a lot of times you can use a laptop in a place of it for about the same amount and have a lot more functionality. And then a lot of times people will use Raspberry Pis for things that an ESP32 would be great for. Somewhere in the middle though, there's something like this where maybe you want something a little bit more power than an ESP, but you don't want to spend all the money that a Raspberry Pi costs. Because no matter how much you think a Raspberry Pi is cheap, once you get all the accessories and you pay for shipping, they're going to be $75 at least. So the light has stopped Flashing. So I'm going to unplug it. I'm going to pop out that SD card and I am going to plug it back in. The initial boot's going to take a little while because it's going to do a setup process. And again, it might move around and do some things while it's booting, but I'll come back in a moment when it's done booting. I think it's done. Let's get out my phone and this should show up as a Wi-Fi access point that we'll access to and then I'm assuming there's going to be a captive portal where we can configure it with our username and password and get some uh, features enabled. So yes, now there is a Thinjingo dash and then there's going to be a couple of characters. I, each camera will come up with its own uh, string for the end so they each have a unique uh, Wi-Fi access point. I will click to connect on that. It's telling me it's not secure because there's no encryption on it at this point, but we'll say connect. And then once it connects, I'm assuming it'll ask me, checking for internet, there's not going to be any internet, and then brought up a captive portal, asking me, saying sign in, that's what a captive portal normal will say, but it gives us some information here. So the four fields on this main screen is I got to give it a host name, so I'm going to give it a unique name so I know what the camera's name is on my network. We're going to create a password for the root user, so make something secure, and then I'm going to give it the information for my Wi-Fi network, my Wi-Fi network name, the SSID, and the password to connect to my Wi-Fi. Okay, I've got that filled out. I'm clicking save credentials, and ready to connect. Please double check the entered data and correct it if you need uh, if you see any errors. Everything looks good and I will click proceed. Configuration complete. Your camera is rebooting to connect to the wireless network. And then it gives me the MAC address for the camera here. Okay, it rebooted. I scanned my network for new devices and I have found one and it has, uh, I did an Nmap scan on it. Port 22, so SSH is open. Port 80, which is web server. 554, which is for streaming video and 
8089, which it says unknown. I'll have to look at the documentation to see what that is. Uh, but let's go ahead and go to that IP address in my web browser. So here it is. Now, when I went to this web page, I didn't record it, but it did pop up a little request for username and password, which I just used the username and password I put in. Be aware at this point, uh, there's no encryption, so anyone on your network will see that traffic, but hopefully your network is secure. And there's other things you can do to secure that. It is giving me a message here at the top. Uh, dollar sign TZ variable, I'm assuming time zone, uh, in the system environment needs updating. Click here to reboot, click here to see time zone settings. I'll look at that later. Uh, but as you can see, it gives you a quick little preview uh, and it's, yeah, it's about a half a second delay, maybe a second delay. Uh, it tells me the camera name here at the top that I put in as the host name. You can't really see it in the camera there. Uh, and then we have uh, date time, up time, uh, and then we have all these options around the side for controlling it and whatnot. So that was super simple to get set up. And again, uh, check out Josh's video if you have any questions. They also have a Discord channel. Check out the website. There's lots of documentation. Very helpful. Very seems like a very active community. Lots of de uh, supported devices. And again, $9.99 for this camera. And I'm really looking forward to playing around with it. I'll give you more information once I get into it more. But I just wanted to go over the setup as I went over it the first time. It could not have gotten any simpler than that. And now I have a Linux server with a camera. Uh, there is a microphone and speaker on here, which I'm assuming is going to work with this software. I can control it with motors. And uh, again, it has the SD card slot, so I could put an SD card in there and I could legit turn this into a server of any type that I want. Obviously, it's not gonna be super fast, but lots of times servers don't need to be. Uh, and this could be a, a, file store, uh, a file server if I needed to with that. Also, realize I don't plan on doing this, uh, I don't know much about uh, this uh, uh, Thinjingo operating system yet, because this is brand new to me. It's my first time experiencing it. I don't know if it's based on another version of Linux or if it's its own fresh thing. Probably something I should have looked at before I record this video. But remember, anytime you have a Linux device, you can always cheer root in something. What, what does that mean? So this is a MIPS processor, I believe, is what I've read in the documentation. Uh, so you have like your, you know, your desktops or x86s, you got your AMDs and whatnot. Uh, ARM devices for a lot of small devices, this is a MIPS. So as long as you can get an operating system, uh, a distribution of Linux that supports this, this uh, hardware, which Debian supports pretty much every type of processor out there, I could always put Debian on this SD card and actually be running Debian off this if for some reason I needed to. Really, I shouldn't need to. With a basic system like this, I'm betting BusyBox is installed on this. You know I talk about BusyBox all the time. 99% of what I need to do on a server can be done with BusyBox. So anything I can think of to do with a server, this could probably do, again, for $10. I, I know I keep repeating myself, but it's just, to me, it's amazing that we can do stuff like this for such a small price. And the freedom it gives you that I can now have cameras that I trust in my house and also that I can just have such a small, cheap device that I can use for anything. And, and for $10, I have a server. So when you're thinking about cloud services out there uh, that you use like Google or Amazon, all that sort of stuff, you could do on this. And you, you have pretty good storage. There's no, no, well, I guess there is a USB drive on here, or a port on here, a USB-C. I wonder if you could use that for storage. So you can hook up an external hard drive. I don't plan on doing that, but I, unless I'm doing it just to play around. But again, SD card, you can get big SD cards. I don't know what this supports up to. Um, but yeah, it's just amazing. Look into this project, learn more about it. If you're interested at all in hardware hacking, this is a great way to get started with these cheap devices. I'll list them and whole community around that supports it. And if you, I always say this, and you know, all my videos are about freedom, free software, and Linux. If you can get a root shell on a Linux device, you control that device. You have freedom, and that's what this is. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> I'm just, I, I hope you can tell how excited I am about this project. I'm looking forward to the other two cameras coming in. Again, I don't expect them to be the highest quality, but the, the quality on this, in this preview, just in the web browser, is great to me. Better than uh, a lot of other devices I've played around with, and definitely better than my old uh, one, uh, Wands View cameras that I have that are like 15 years old that I used to use as baby cameras uh, when my kids were small. Anyway, thanks for watching. Films by Chris.com. That's Chris with the K. As always, I hope that you have a great day. I forgot to say something. Just my natural way, I hook this up to my network and I scan my network for it, but I forgot something Josh showed in his video. Again, even though I'm going over all the same stuff, you may want to check out his video in the description of this video. Um, there's a button here, you know, like a reset button, which 
I might be able to press without it, but I'm going to use a little thing to press it. And when you press that button, get it in there. IP address is 192.168.1.161. So you don't need to scan your network. You press that button, or if you ever forget, or you, it might change if you don't set it to be a static IP address. Uh, you press that button, and the camera will speak to you and tell you what its IP address is, which is awesome. So thanks again for watching.